It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Christopher Leinberger. He's a professor, developer, and author. And I would describe his mission as finding a balance uh, between business realities and social and environmental concerns. He has several roles. He's president of LOCUS, Responsible Real Estate Developers and Investors. He's the Charles Be uh, Bennett uh, Distinguished uh, George Washington University School of Business. He's a non-resident senior fellow with the Brookings Institution. And he's the founding partner of Arcadia Land Company, a new urban transit-oriented development firm. His education is from Swarthmore and Harvard. He's uh, the author of numerous uh, uh, articles. You can find them quite easily on the Brookings website. And uh, he, uh, he is, uh, has commentaries in many major media, including the New York Times, Atlantic Monthly. And he's recently published a very nice, short, readable, uh, in, very interesting uh, argument for the case for walkable communities. And uh, so his views in that book are very interesting, and uh, we look forward to bring him bringing his views to us uh, today. So I welcome uh, Dr. Christopher Leinberger. Wayne, you got one thing wrong. I am not a doctor. Uh, so if there's any medical problems, don't come to me. Uh, I'm a quasi-academic. The academics get really n nervous when I come into the room. Um, I, I will mention that I, um, I think I can say without equivocation that, and, and I could not say this about my former university, which is the University of uh, Michigan, where I started their real estate program, but now I'm at George Washington um, up in D.C., and I can basically say you Gators could never, never beat GW in football. We don't have a team. As I say, you could probably beat Michigan at this point. They've sunk so low. Um, so what I want to talk about is you here in Florida. And what you've heard yesterday and this morning is about cyclical issues affecting our industry. You know, you students who have gotten into real estate, you are hopefully learning what us gray hairs have learned painfully, is that real estate is the most cyclical business in the entire economy. When we boom, we boom like no others. When we go down, we die. And get used to it. It's been that way for, oh, 6,000 years. And uh, it's going to be that way for your entire career. And, but I'm not talking about cyclicality here. I spent a lot of time, prior to um, this, this academic phase of my life, I was a developer, and then prior to that, I owned a company called Robert Charles Lesser and Company, RCL Co. Many of you may know Greg Logan here in town, who runs the Southeast operation for, for Robert Charles Lesser and Company. I owned it, ran it for 20 years, sold it about 2,000 to get into real estate development. And, we focused on strategic planning for real estate companies to deal with those cycles, to be evergreen during those cycles. I'm not talking about that today. What I'm talking about is the structural shift that we have just begun, a structural shift that is going to take at least a generation to play out. The last structural shift we saw was back in the 40s and 50s, and most of us gray hairs grew up, learned everything we know about this business during that structural era, which I refer to as when we built our drivable suburban places. And what we've seen, what the research shows throughout the country is that we're in the middle of this, we're at the beginning of this next structural shift. And the thing is, is that with, when you have a structural shift, all the stuff that we've learned about land acquisition, construction, zoning, design, finance, how to build low density versus high density, the management of our corporations, and the management of place. 
If you learn that stuff in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, put it into your trash can on your desktop and erase. Because it's an entirely different set of, of rules, a whole different way of thinking about real estate development. And you students in the audience, hopefully this is what you're learning, because this is the future. So I want to talk about that future and about the fact that you've got a walkable urban future in this state. And it's about time that you catch up with the rest of the country because you're lagging tremendously. Now, of course, this is somewhat ironic. My real estate partner is Robert Davis. Robert Davis is the developer of and still owns downtown Seaside, which was the first new urbanist project in the country. Huge impact on the industry. I was also, as a consultant, working on, um, on a celebration just a few miles from here. In fact, a little story that um, celebration was conceived of by Eisner, then CEO of Disney. You may not know that Epcot was Disney, Walt Disney's concept of what he wanted um, to, to develop as his, as his second park down here. Well, Epcot stands for, you may not know this, Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. And what they built is basically a World's Fair, a permanent World's Fair. So Eisner saw that that was not what Disney wanted. So Eisner pulled together a few folks, including myself, to figure out what the experimental prototype community of tomorrow was. And eventually, it was built out a celebration. When we first came back, you know, after Eisner was in that first meeting, you know, CEO, lead the charge, big vision, uh, the second meeting we had with the bureaucrats at Disney. And we were talking about things that eventually become celebration. And the bureaucrat said, so, first question, where has this been done before? And I said to them, uh, what don't you understand about experimental or prototype or community of tomorrow? But, so they eventually pushed it through. Peter Rummel, of course, was the president that really, or the president of the development company that uh, many of you, of course, know Peter. So the issue is, is that with, with Seaside, which we learned so much from, why haven't you kept up? And Seaside's a second home community, so that's not exactly typical of what we build in the built environment. Second homes are, you know, maybe 5% of the total built environment. And you also have, you know, Celebration is basically a primary home neighborhood. It's not what I recall, or it's, it, it's not what I uh, call regionally significant. It's not where we make our living. It's not where we make wealth in our society. It's, it's a bedroom community, very cute little bedroom community. But you've really fallen behind as far as building regionally significant walkable urban places. And you're going to catch up with it, because the rest of the country is going this way. And that it's going to fundamentally change how you do your business, how you zone, how you finance, how you build. So what are we talking about? And, and again, students, just so you know what you've gotten yourself into, is that the built environment, real estate, and all the infrastructure that supports real estate, makes up a mere 35% of the assets of the entire economy. It's the largest asset class, that if you took all the New York Stock Exchange companies, took all the NASDAQ companies, added up their capitalized value, the built environment's twice the size. So that's why you all should be very proud of the fact of the last three recessions, we in real estate caused two of them. And I think you will agree that this last time, we really did it up right. And it's my contention that why this economy continues after, I mean, we've been technically out of the Great Recession for nearly five years. And why we are only bumping along at 2% GDP growth is because people in this room and the real estate industry in general have not figured out that there's a structural shift that has occurred. The market wants something fundamentally different, and we're not producing it. We're just going back and producing buggy whips the same way that we did um, you know, in, in the times past, because we, re, we need to retool the industry. So start with transportation. 
There are 15 different infrastructure categories. First among equals is transportation. For 6,000 years of building cities, the transportation system you've selected dictates the form of the built environment. So what we've been building for the last 50, 60 years, which is what the market wanted, was based upon, obviously, a highway-based transportation system. And what you get for that is drivable suburban, low density. Every product type is separate from one another. The only way to get around is by car. You must drive a car. You have no choice but to drive a car. You're mandated, and everything is subsidized to make you drive a, drive a car. Now, the market wanted this, as I said. Now, the only other way to build the built environment, in broad terms, one's drivable suburban, the other is walkable urban. And walkable urban means that you have multiple transportation, uh, multiple transportation options. Cars are certainly crucial, still part of the mix, of course, but they aren't mandatory. You've got rail transit, and by the way, real rail transit. You guys have been putting in down here commuter rail which is a poor man's transit system that doesn't do much as far as the built environment. I'm talking heavy rail, light rail, streetcars. And also, very importantly, bikes. Bikes could play a role of, of, of moving us around. Probably 20% of all trips can be moved around by bike. And in fact, we have examples throughout the world of that happening in first world cities. And of course, walkability. Once you get to wherever you're going, it's walkable, which means it's much higher density, a mix of uses, and you can walk to all of those uses. And by the way, when you go back and take a look at how big those kind of places are, on average, when, when we see these regionally significant walkable urban places, they average about 400 acres in size. It's not a large amount of land. You know, it's the size of two, maybe three regional malls, and you've got a major concentration of economic development activity and in fact, the future of wealth creation in the country. So the corollary to transportation drives development is that you do not build transportation systems to move people. That's not the goal. And we have all these transit agencies and highway uh, guys that all they want to do is have great throughput of people. That's not the goal. The goal is economic development at the stations. The means. Is, is in fact moving people. And we've, we've confused the ends and means. And you end up with some pretty silly systems when you do that. Now, why did we build this drivable suburban world that you here in Florida have perfected? Um, that we did it, and you may not recognize this, but 40 to 45 percent of all jobs, directly and indirectly, back in the 1970s, the peak of the industrial age, was related to, the raw manufacture, uh, related to the raw material going into the manufacturing, the sales, the servicing, the fueling, the financing, building the roads for, and insuring the automobile. So it only made sense that we would build a built environment that made us wealthier. So for those gray hairs out there that, that, that remember that great phrase, or that great jingle from, from uh, Chevy, when you were seeing the USA in your Chevrolet, you were making yourself wealthier. So it only made sense. It lined up with the underlying economy. So again, two ways of building the built environment. Walkable urban, drivable suburban. And prior to the Second World War, this country pretty much only built walkable urban. Then after the Second World War, we pushed that pendulum all the way over and we built exclusively drivable suburban. Again, the market wanted it. We in real estate got really good at providing it. So what did the second half of the 20th century look like? Well, it started, of course, with freeways. Transportation drives development. We learned how to do subdivisions. Then we learned how to do regional malls. This is the regional mall that I grew up in outside of Philadelphia, King of Prussia, great name, King of Prussia Mall, now the largest mall on the East Coast. And um, when I first went there as a kid, I drove on the freeways with these, over, with these ramps that were taking you onto these freeways. And you go to this great 
big emporium of shopping. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I thought this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Of course, we've gotten much better, and you have gotten much better, at building freeways. And by the way, our biggest challenge as far as, uh, as, far as infrastructure finance over the next generation is maintaining these suckers. Outside of Washington, we have the Beltway. The Beltway is 45 years old. It needs to be fundamentally scraped and rebuilt without closing it. It's going to cost, in real dollar terms, two or three times the original cost of construction to do it lane by lane, taking it down to the dirt and rebuilding it. That's the situation throughout the country. And then, of course, we know how it laid out on the ground. That in this country, for every 1% population growth during the late 20th century, we had 6 to 8% land use consumption. Now, we had lots of land. You know, we'd use the land, throw it away, and move on out to the next fringe. And, you know, we, we have so much land in this, you know, we basically stole this land fair and square, and we have a lot of it. So we have, in fact, continued to build and build out towards the fringe. Now, fast forward to the knowledge economy. The knowledge economy is, requires far fewer car trips, far fewer truck trips. That this, the, the software that is running this PowerPoint, I got wirelessly. There was not one truck involved with shipping that product to me. And as Richard Florida has demonstrated, uh, that, that, that the creative class, those folks that are fueling the highly educated young people that are fueling the knowledge economy, they want to live in walkable urban places to share ideas. The next economy to come, I think, layering on top of the knowledge economy, which layers on top of the industrial, which layers on top of the old farm e uh, economy, is the experience economy. And we're just beginning to see baby steps there. The biggest example, of course, and you've got it down here in spades, is, of course, tourism. That's an experience economy industry. The best example in retailing, I think, is Apple. Apple stores. Steve Jobs comes up with Apple stores. You may remember, eight, nine years ago. This is just when Disney stores were crashing and burning. And everybody was saying, Steve Jobs, get real. If Disney, the world's greatest merchandiser, can't make it in retail, why do you think you, 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 know, you, um, you a software wonks, how do you think you can do it in retail? Well, what they did is that they took the lowest paid people in a store and turned them into, you know, turned them into computer consultants. Now, you all know that, that, track, that track retailing, that, that, a, that Macy's does maybe five, $600 per square foot, that a grocery store like Whole Foods will do eight, nine, $1,000 per square foot. The highest store category has always been jewelry stores. They sell something very valuable that's very small in a very small space. They do, on average, $1,500 per square foot. Apple stores do between five and six hundred dollars per square foot. But five, I'm sorry, five to six thousand dollars per square foot. Slipped a zero. I used to pole vault as a kid, and the world record in pole vaulting right now is about 21 feet. That's as if somebody came along and started jumping 60 feet. That's not pole vaulting. That's an entirely different animal altogether. That's what Apple stores have done. That's what the experience economy is going to do as we learn how to do it. Most experiences, not all, most experiences are walkable urban. The best example I can show you is, of course, Disney World, where you pay, what, what is it, 100 bucks to get in the, uh, into the gate to have a walkable urban experience. So what we're seeing is not a rejection of the old American dream of a single family home. It's just that we've overbuilt that stuff. In fact, it's my contention, and I'm, I'm doing research now up in Boston, and, and, if, and, and then we're going to take it nationally, that I think will prove this, that the Great Recession was caused by the overbuilding of the drivable suburban fringe, not the walkable urban product. The walkable urban product went flat and now is roaring back. 
It's the drivable suburban fringe that lost 40, 50, 60 percent of its value on a, on a, a price per square foot basis. In essence, a lot of the drivable suburban fringe land values are, are, are theoretically negative. You would have to subsidize them to get something to pencil. That's the structural change that we're seeing. So somewhere in the mid-90s, we, we began to see, at that point I still owned Robert Charles Lesser and Company, doing you know, 600 projects throughout, throughout the country for developers, for investors, to try to figure out what they should build and how does it, and how does it pencil. And we began to see some strange things happening that we didn't expect as our downtowns started to come back. Some of our suburban downtowns started to come back. And we saw prices appreciating in places that used to be slums. We didn't get this. So what are the reasons? The primary reason for this, we know who to blame for this structural change. It's the damn kids. It's the millennials that are driving this. So you students out there, we hold you to blame for us having to flush all of our knowledge about real estate and retool ourselves. That, and, and by the way, it is best seen in movies and in television shows. And by the way, with movies, just so happened this morning I had a thing on Next City magazine, a web-based magazine, if you know it, nextcity.com, I think it is. Uh, a truly scholarly piece of work that will make you at the University of Florida uh, really jealous of the, uh, of the in-depth research that we do at Brookings and, at the uh, and, and, and up at GW. I have a list of the top 12 urban movies of all time. And, um, but moving over to TVs, when, when we baby boomers were growing up, the TV shows we watched were Leave it to Beaver and Dick Van Dyke and, uh, and the Brady Bunch, all set in the suburbs, dry, it, it, out in drivable suburban places. Now, back in the 50s, only 25% of us lived in the suburbs. Now it's over 50%. But Hollywood, who does more consumer research than certainly our home builders, we know, we just heard uh, today, that that Hollywood does all this consumer research, they want to show us what we aspire to. That's why they were showing us Leave it to Beaver back in the 50s when most of the people watching were in cities. Now fast forward and, and look at what our kids have been raised on and what the students today have been raised on. Seinfeld, Friends, Sex in the City, How I Met Your Mother, all set in walkable urban places. This is a reflection of aspirations of the rising generation. Of course, you can't get rid of the baby boomers. In fact, given how our 401ks have tanked, you may never get rid of us. We're never leaving. Um, that, as you've heard earlier uh, today, we're becoming empty nesters, and we're going to be retiring soon. And we all know that retirees tend to downsize. Some are going to be downsizing into walkable urban places, not all. So when you add up those two generations that are the two largest generations, as you heard earlier, in the history of the country, over 55% of all Americans are in those two generations. When you look at it from a household point of view, back in the 60s, 70s, 50% of all households had children living in them. 50% were singles and couples. Today, it's 75% are singles and couples. Singles and couples are the target market for walkable urbanism. Now, they aren't the only, I mean, obviously families are welcome. I live near Georgetown, and Georgetown has a baby boom going on, particularly as the schools in DC, believe it or not, are getting significantly better, and, and particularly the grade schools. And, and I know this because I go to Georgetown, they have these brick sidewalks that are somewhat narrow, and all these millennials, for some reason, they always have, when they have kids, they always have these double-wide Cadillac strollers. And you take the entire sidewalk up. You have to go into the street to, to get by. Um, but we're seeing it in the Upper West Side of New York, in Lincoln Park, in, you know, in and near downtown Seattle, in Capitol Hill in Seattle, all throughout the country. Families being raised in walkable urban places. But now let's look at the household growth in the future as far as their composition. Over the next 20 years, the marginal increase in house come, as far as household growth, just what's going to be added 
only 14% will have children living in them. 86% will be singles and couples. The market's telling us something. They want to change. And of course, the other reason for change is sheer boredom. People forget how important boredom is as far as a social change. Most metro areas in Florida, if you move to them today, and you, wanted, and you had choice, and you wanted to buy a house, you could buy a single family house, or you can buy a single family house, your choice. If you want to go shopping, you can go to a 1980s strip mall or a 1990s strip mall. There is no choice. And that's what the market's demanding. And then I mentioned earlier about how the creative class, the young knowledge workers that are driving this economy more than any other factor, are demanding walkable urban places. You heard about, about the warehouses that are, you know, the brick warehouses being converted to high-tech centers. But then finally, something that we in real estate have forgotten is the expense of maintaining cars. That we baby boomers all grew up on the Beach Boys singing about you know, how basically you are who your car is. And cars were very important to us psychologically. They also helped, have to, you know, they helped us in real estate get our customers to, uh, to our product. What we didn't realize is that the car companies were eating our lunch. That when you look at household spending on transportation, on average, it's 19% per household. And it's been going up for decades. If you disaggregate the data between drivable suburban and walkable urban households, drivable suburban households are spending 25% of their income on transportation to maintain a fleet of cars, second only to the cost of housing. And our housing dollars are getting squeezed. Walkable urban, it's only 9%. That 16% delta is over the nation, hundreds of billions of dollars of spending per year all of which leads, leaves the local economy unless you're in Detroit and goes to Detroit or goes to Stuttgart or goes to Saudi Arabia and our friends in Venezuela. And it doesn't stay local. It doesn't go into our pockets as real estate developers. There's a lot of consumer research that backs this up. I can give you lots of examples of that, including the National Association of Realtors' most recent two surveys. But this is one from a former colleague of mine at, at the University of Michigan that basically shows very in-depth research in, in metro Atlanta and up in Boston. One could argue the two bookends of US metro areas. And that roughly 30, 40% of us want to live in walkable urban. 30, 40% of us want to live in drivable suburban. And 30% could go either way. So it's your classic 50-50 America down the middle kind of split that we see in so many things, including politics. Well, now look at the supply side. If you here in Florida have more than 3 or 5% of your supply in walkable urban places, I'd be surprised. So what do you have when you have high demand and low supply? You, of course, have pent-up demand. What do you have when you have pent-up demand? You have price premiums. In my research throughout the country, we're seeing on a price per square foot basis 40 to 200% price premiums for walkable urban product, whether it be office, retail, housing, rental apartments, over comparable drivable suburban. We've seen lines cross throughout the country in what the market is valuing and where the price premiums are. So one other sheer sign of this that is just remarkable to see, I never thought I'd see this, is that in economics, the number one thing that you could bet on is that the growth in GDP is mirrored one-to-one -one by, by the growth in how much we drive, measured by vehicle miles traveled, VMT. So if GDP went up 3%, vehicle miles traveled went up 3%. If we were in a recession, went down 1%, vehicle miles traveled went down 1%. That relationship has held for 100 years until the mid-90s, and vehicle miles traveled started to flatten out. In fact, we are right now past peak driving. In this country, in absolute terms, and on a per capita basis, particularly on a per capita basis, since we continue to add population, 
We peaked in 2004. We're down 6%, absolutely 10% on a per capita basis. No economist would ever have guessed that happening. And again, we know who to blame for it. It's those damn kids again. Those between 16 and 34 peaked their driving in 2001. When, by the way, keep in mind, gas was a dollar a gallon. So you baby boomers, remember back, you know, in real dollar term, terms, a buck a gallon in, in, back in 1990 was the same, or I mean, back in 2000, was the same that we paid in high school, 25 cents a gallon. The lowest gas prices in at least 60 years, possibly for all times, was in 2000. That's when the young people decided that they were going to slow down their driving. They, they were not getting their licenses. They were not buying into the car culture. What were they buying into? Cell phones, smartphones. That's what they want. And where is the one place you can't use a smartphone or cell phone? In your car when you're driving. So what we've seen is it peaking in, 19, in 2001, it's down 33% on a per capita basis for 16 to 34 year olds. It's dropped off a cliff. So for your future, as far as building your own career, recognize that we in real estate got really good, the best analogy I can come up with is that we got really good at driving NASCARs. Now NASCARs, as you probably know, they go straight or they turn left. They're engineered only to turn left, which is somewhat ironic given their political points of view. And going 150 miles per hour. What we have to retool ourselves to do, and you wouldn't want to do this without a lot of training, and as I say, retooling, we have to learn how to fly fighter jets, which means you go straight, turn left, turn right, zoom up five miles, or crash and burn in seconds going 600 miles an hour while you're being shot at. A fundamentally different skill set. That's why I said earlier, if you know how to drive that NASCAR really well, you have two choices. One is keep on driving and you'll run out of track, or retool, flush your knowledge of NASCAR and learn how to fly fighter jets. But if you do learn how to fly fighter jets, it's a fundamentally different economic equation because as you add more activity, more office buildings, more apartments, more retail to a great walkable urban place, it just gets better. It starts an upward spiral. More people on the street mean more sales, mean higher property taxes. It's a great business to be in and one of the reasons that you're beginning to see a slowdown in the trades as far, uh, as far, as far as institutions in trading property is because there's no better return than a walkable urban product that's just going to continue to get better because other developers come in and build around you, making your asset more valuable by just maintaining it. So now there is a downside to this. There's no such thing as a free lunch. We've had an affordable housing strategy in this country that you know well down here, which is, of course, drive until you qualify. Just drive another 10, 20, 30 miles, and you'll find something that you can afford. You, of course, now have to pay 30, 40% of your household income in supporting that fleet of cars. You don't get to see your kids, um, but we can give you a product. So we need, now need to have a much more conscious affordable housing strategy in these walkable urban places. So we have our workforce that can have a place to live, and we've got to put in the infrastructure, particularly rail transit and biking, that'll better connect these places to lower income housing concentrations. So what, what's my research on? There are seven types of walkable urban places in this country, in any metropolitan area. The first, of course, and these are, by the way, only the regionally significant ones. I'm, I'm not talking about local serving bedroom communities. They exist as well. I just haven't focused on them as far as this presentation. Regionally significant places. Downtowns, of course. All the downtown turnarounds. So downtown Miami. You guys know what it was 20 years ago in downtown Miami. And it's really coming back quite remarkably. Downtown or Orlando. Downtown St. Pete. Some pretty impressive downtown turnarounds here in Florida. The second 
are downtown adjacent places. These are my favorite. I live in DuPont Circle up in DC, which is a downtown adjacent place. Lower density, different, regionally significant role in the economy. Here in Florida, Hyde Park, of course, is a gem over in Tampa. Brickell, Miami Design District down in Miami, great examples of downtown adjacent places. Then we have urban commercial. These were local serving walkable urban places 100 years ago. They all went downhill as we decided to move out of our cities. And they're now coming back. So in Miami, Little Havana, Lincoln Road, of course, Wybor City in Tampa. These are urban commercial districts that are now playing a regionally significant role that are walkable urban. Then finally, something that you all know here very well, urban universities. And the example is sitting in front of me, the University of Florida. And we're seeing a great concentration of walkable urban development around universities. So some examples of that from throughout the country, of course, downtown Washington. Downtown Washington 20 years ago had 90 surface parking lots. Today, it has zero. With the height limit in place, it is 96% built out with the second highest office rents in the country. 20 years ago, you wouldn't be caught dead in downtown DC. Mm, then again, you might have been. Today, it's where all the hot new restaurants open. Downtown Seattle, same thing. It was really dodgy 20 years ago. Now it is the hottest place to live. Downtown adjacent place is South Lake Union, just to the north, an old industrial section where Vulcan um, uh, is, a, is a major developer. Vulcan is, out of, is, is owned by Paul Allen, one of the founders of, of course, Microsoft. They built a streetcar. I talked about the importance of streetcars. They built a streetcar from downtown up to, to South Lake Union, half of it paid for by the private sector. It's now the home of Amazon and the University of Washington's medical center and all their biotech research. It's where the young people, the young knowledge workers want to be. They don't want to be in you know, the far fringes. They want to be in South Lake Union. Now, those are the places taking, or those are the walk-ups taking place. And we call them walk-ups because walkable urban places, too long to say. We used to call them WUPs, um, whoops. From a marketing point of view, that didn't cut it. So somebody more creative than me came up with walk-ups. So these walk-ups certainly are taking place in the center city, but it's even more so taking place in the suburbs. We're seeing the urbanization of the suburbs be the biggest trend in this regard. And um, so the first place that we're seeing this are the suburban town centers. And you've got a lot of examples here in Florida, of course, up and down the the, um, the coast in southeast Florida, where you're seeing, you know, of course, um, Fort Lauderdale and West Palm all improve tremendously in the downtown. Winter Park, right here. And Coral Gables, of course, everybody's favorite. It was so beautifully designed back in the 20s, and it's coming back, it, it has come back so beautifully. The next one's going to be the biggest, though. The redevelopment of strip commercial. We have 10,000 dead or dying strip malls and regional malls in this country. And, and obviously, we have not built a new regional mall in a decade. And so what we are seeing is the redevelopment of existing regional malls into walkable, urban, dense places. The best example in Florida, of course, is Dadlin. But throughout the rest of the country, um, well, th let me just go to the uh, seventh one. Um, then what you're going to see a lot of here is greenfield developments. These are places that are greenfields and you just add water and poof, instant urbanity. Very expensive to pull off. Celebration to a certain extent is, falls into this category. But let me show you some examples throughout the country. The best place to understand, that if you want to understand the urbanization of the suburbs, you must understand Arlington, Virginia. The best example in the country. They have, they have seven regionally significant walk-ups there. It's the smallest county in the country physically as far as size. And this is a shot of an abandoned Sears store in one of those seven places. It was abandoned about 20 years ago. So typical big box, empties out, leaves behind a hulk, and a lot of surface parking lots. 
This is the same view today. Apple Store, Pottery Barn, Whole Foods, and $600 per square foot condos on top. Incredibly successful, all within walking distance of a heavy rail metro station. And the amazing thing about, as far as Arlington, they've just gone so much further than anybody else, is that if you go two blocks north or south of this location, you go back into the single family housing. Those single family houses are the most expensive housing single-family houses on a price per square foot basis in Arlington. Why? Because they have the best of two worlds. They can live in suburbia and walk to 50 restaurants, walk to the metro, maybe walk to work. This is, by the way, our number one way we're going to deal with NIMBY opposition. We're beginning to see the emergence of YIMBY support for high-density development. Yes, in my backyard, damn it, we want high density in our backyard because we want our, our home prices to go up. My research shows between, between 40 and 100% price premium to live in those single family homes near great urbanism. The other thing about Arlington, these seven walkable urban places are all of 10% of their land mass in the entire region. 20 years ago, it was 20% of their tax revenues into the county and falling as shown by the picture on the left. Today, it's 55% of their tax base. All of their growth, because Arlington's built out as far as single family, all of their growth, and it's been substantial, has been attached and you know, rental apartment and condos and townhouses, all within these, these walkable urban places. And therefore, all those people living in those units pay school taxes, but they don't send their kids to school. Arlington, which speaks 30 different languages in their public schools, has among the best school district in the country because they are just, it's just a wash in capital coming from the development of this 10% of their land. So, Dadeland, of course, one of the great examples that you're going to see, you know, repeated throughout Florida, but it's, it's one of your best of a, of, a, of a strip mall that is being reconverted. This is the best example we have in the country of a regional mall being converted. This is out in Denver in, a, in the inner suburban town of Lakewood. This is the first regional mall in Denver, built in the early 60s. It was known as Via Italia. Um, the, the, the developer obviously went to Italy, and he decided that putting these little arches would somehow make it Italian, but it's obviously just a regular plain vanilla regional mall. Obviously very, very successful, as you see all the cars parked in the parking lot. This shot was taken about 20 years ago. By 10 years ago, the place was abandoned except for one of the anchor stores. All the rest had boarded up. Typical story. And what they did, a developer, a friend of mine, Mark Falcone, who ironically, Mark, his father was one of the first regional mall developers in the country. Now Mark, age 40, is bulldozing regional malls and putting in a grid of streets, and it, is, it now looks like a great walkable urban place. Grid of streets, high density, residential, retail, office, and great street life there in Belmar. 60% price premium over the rest of its submarket in every product category. Reston Town Center is kind of the grandfather of Greenfield sites. So if you want to start this kind of a massive undertaking and do have A, deep pockets, and B, a lot of guts to pull off something like this, Reston Town Center out in Virginia, again, um, uh, was the first in this generation of Greenfield walkable urban places ever developed starting back in the early 90s. It gets an 80% price premium over the rest of Reston to live within walking distance of the 70 restaurants and all the great high density there. Interestingly, it started without rail transit. It's getting rail transit in four years. <clears throat> so when you look at this, again, breaking it down between the suburbs and the city, <clears throat> and by the way, to a certain extent, the concept of suburbs and cities, flush that too. It doesn't work anymore. The big divide is between drivable suburban and walkable urban. So in Washington, D.C., which is leading the country in this trend, as far as Metro Washington, what we've found in our research 
is that 42% of the walkable urban places are in the District of Columbia. 58% are in the suburbs. That's why I say the urbanization of the suburbs is the big trend here. Over the last three real estate cycles, 24% in the 1990s of walkable urban development um, is, was the market capture of, of walkable urban places in Metro Washington in the 1990s real estate cycle. In the 2000s real estate cycle, it was 33%. And in this real estate cycle, it's 49%. And this really understates it because I'm only looking at regionally significant places that I've captured, but, I've, but I'm then comparing it to the entire, you know, everything delivered in this real estate cycle that ignores local serving places, bedroom communities. If I added that in, I'm pretty certain 80% of all product delivered in Metro Washington is high density walkable urban. If you're in the drivable suburban business in Washington, you're a dodo. You're, you're gonna face extinction. Same thing, by the way, in Atlanta. I just did this up in Atlanta. Atlanta, which in the, er in the early 90s, I proclaimed that Atlanta was the poster child of sprawl. That it had grown physically faster than any human settlement in the history of mankind. Um, I kind of made that up, but somebody else came and backed me up and, in fact, uh, did the research behind that. But looking at Metro Atlanta just recently, we just released this research uh, about four months ago. In the 1990s, they delivered 12% of their real estate product in walkable urban places in the 1990s. No surprise. In the 2000s real estate cycle, it was 26%. Today, it is 60% of real estate product has been delivered to walkable urban places. Though, by the way, in both Washington and Atlanta, those walkable urban places represent 1% of the land mass. So we can now say with some pretty good certainty that the poster child of sprawl is witnessing the end of sprawl in this cycle. I was shocked to see this. So we're seeing prices. Again, we're seeing cri uh, prices, uh, the uh, prices paid for housing, say, cross throughout the country. In Denver, there was a place called Highlands near downtown that in the 70s and 80s was a slum, by the mid 90s was beginning to come back, but Highlands Ranch, which is a master plan community 18 miles south of downtown, you would get a 25% price premium if you moved to, um, or you have to pay a 25% price premium if you move to Highlands Ranch over Highlands. Today, you're gonna have a 100% price premium in the Highlands. The lines have crossed. We're seeing this throughout the country of slums becoming the most highly valued places in the entire region. So what about Florida? We're about to come out with a top 30 ranking of the largest 30 metros in the country. I did this at Brookings about five, six years ago, and I'm coming out with this in a couple months. And the preliminary findings on the left in red are the three most walkable places in the country as far as metro regions. And I just picked out of the data the office space. So this is just the office space, not residential, not rental uh, 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 apartment. But right now, 53% of all the office space in DC is in walkable urban places. In Boston, it's 43%. San Francisco is 37%. In DC today, in this real estate cycle, 85% of all office product is within 200 yards of a metro station and is walkable urban, 85%. 90% of all rental apartments delivered in Washington, in Metro Washington, in this real estate cycle, and we all know there's been a huge boom these last four or five years, has been within walking distance of metro stations. So now take a look at, of course, Florida. Your three major metros that are in the top 30 metros are all at the bottom. And um, Tampa is number 30. Um, Miami is about 22, I seem to remember, as far as urbanism. So you are definitely behind. And the question is, since you invented 
new urbanism in this state, again, primarily new urbanism, local serving, bedroom communities, why haven't you figured this out in the regionally significant places? And it might just be, I mean, there's special reasons for it. You've got an older demographic. You're, uh, unfortunately, your demographic is not as well educated. This is really being driven by high, highly educated households. If there's one thing that really, well, the, the highest correlation is uh, as, as far as value creation is your walk score. How many of you know what walk score is? Well, this just demonstrates about 10% of you. You must know what walk score is. It's the determinant of value today in real estate. Go to walkscore.com and you'll get a score between zero and 100 as to the walkability of your home, your neighborhood, your metro region. And you're at the bottom. Anything above 70 walk score is walkable urban. In Metro Washington, for every one walk score point increase, office rents go up a buck a foot per year. Retail goes up, and retail and rental apartment goes up 80 cents a square foot per year. For sale housing goes up 20 bucks a square foot for every one walk score point. It's the leading determinant. The second determinant is the education of your workforce. And those three on the left are the three most educated metro areas in the country. They have the most people with their college, with their college degrees. So there's some obviously unique demographics going on down here in Florida that would lead you to believe that you would not be leading the pack. But this is where the country is going, and you're going to catch up at some point. So let me end as a university professor with some homework, a to-do list. First, again, as I stated earlier, you've been the leader. You know, Andreas Duani, you're probably sick and tired of hearing from Andreas. Victor Dover and all the rest have been some of the best thinkers in local serving stuff. Some of them have geared up to the regionally significant, but most have been focused on local serving bedroom communities like Seaside and Celebration. But you need to pick up your game and move into the regionally significant walkable urban places. You need to continue to rediscover those grand walkable urban towns in the early 20th century, like I mentioned earlier, West Palm and Fort Lauderdale, Hyde Park. These are fabulous examples of urbanism that you've rediscovered. A lot of your growth is going to go there in the future. You've got to do many, many, many more strip redevelopments like Dadlin. And you've got to get serious about rail transit. As I saw that silly little Tudor trolley going uh, up through Winter Park last night, the, um, the little commuter rail with almost nobody in it, commuter rail is not the solution. It's heavy rail, it's light rail, it is streetcars. And by the way, just as a point of fact, if you think, oh, we can't afford this, well, for one thing, if Panama City and Colombia and, and Bogota and, and other third world countries can afford it, we can afford it. But just so you know, the, the, the price or the cost of building heavy rail, as far as how much it costs on a per supportable square foot basis, is a fraction of the freeways you're building. Freeways are far more, in, far more expensive as far as the supportable real estate that they support before they reach capacity. The, the, the infrastructure that's going to focus on no more than, in fact, my hypothesis is, is that 80, 90 percent of all development in the next generation will be in less than 10 percent of your existing land. And putting the infrastructure in, even heavy rail, is not going to be that costly on a price uh, on a cost per supportable square foot. And then finally, it's going to be up to us, folks. Real estate is on the cutting edge of this. We're going to be the ones that make this happen. If I gave this talk in Metro DC, which is leading the country right now in building walkable urban 20 years ago, I would get the same skeptical reaction I suspect I'm getting this morning here. Today, if, if, I, you know, if I've made this presentation up in Washington, they, they all yawn and say, so tell us something we don't know. We're all doing this stuff. You've got a long way to go to, to, to catch up, but you've got a lot of lessons that you can learn from the Arlingtons and the Denvers and the Seattles and the Washingtons that will apply here. And oh, by the way, the, these other places that you more compare yourself to, like the Phoenixes and as I say, the Denvers and even the Dallases that are in front of you, 
in this kind of development. So welcome to the future. This is your America over the next generation. Thank you very much.